talk about a topic that I hope is near and dear to many of your hearts, and that is kids. All this talk about the future of work and the future of our economy, what does it mean for kids, what they need, what they need in school, uh, how we're going to help them get it. The second thing we're going to try to do is to keep you all engaged in, in, in the conversation. Um, we got set up for that, I think, well this morning by um, both Mike's challenge in looking at that data on K-12 outcomes, that PISA and NAEP data that's looking pretty flat. Um, and if you dig into that data uh, a little more closely, you'll see even an, an even more troubling story, uh, which is that, for example, um, on that PISA data for 15-year-olds, if you break down US students by demographics and you look at literacy, white students in America, white 15-year-olds, are number one in the world. <clears throat> Unfortunately, black 15-year-olds are in the bottom thir three countries in the OECD, and Latino students are not much further ahead in terms of way below average. So we have a really specific challenge in this country that's less about um, all kids and more about which kids. Um, and similarly with the NAEP data, it showed recently that the kids that actually are improving are the ones that were already at that proficient and exceeding level. They're getting better. But the kids who are behind grade level are plateaued or even declining in, at fourth and eighth grade. So really wanted to actually shift our topic a little bit here from the idea that K-12 um, can benefit from ed tech in terms of transforming outcomes and talk about like, can ed tech help transform outcomes, not just for all kids, but for students of color in our country who are currently you know, sitting at those levels that should just be un completely unacceptable to all of us. So in order to keep you engaged in that, we got set up by John Katzman this morning with the idea that, in fact, EdTech has totally failed. We aren't seeing any progress. It's failure time. Um, and I really wanted to set up the conversation today to, to really debate that topic and to have your opinions on that as well. So at the end, we're going to do a little poll and find out how many people in the room think EdTech is failing and how many are still optimistic that that transformation is possible and that we're, we're just not seeing um, yet enough of those outliers popping up to, to shift our perceptions on that. So we'll do a little poll. We won't caucus. Obviously, that's fraught with peril. We'll, we'll just do a straight up vote. <laughs> so I want to challenge you to do things. Think about that question as we talk and uh, decide where you are on the spectrum from failure to great potential for future success. Um, and then think about some hard questions you can offer our panel. So I'll go ahead and introduce our panel. We won't um, do a lot of talking individually at first. We'll just dive right into the discussion. Uh, we have Stephen Smith who is the CEO and founder of um, IntelliSpark, a company that's focused on helping students navigate uh, and have a plan for success. Uh, Jesse Willie Wilson, many of you who know, is the CEO and president of Dreambox Learning, an adaptive learning platform for uh, K-8 and beyond, I think, no? Um, we have DeAndre Weaver, who is the superintendent of DeSoto Independent School District in Texas. So great to have an educator on our panel today to bring that perspective. And um, finally, um, Mike Evans, who is the Chief Revenue Officer at HMH and long-standing education publishing executive. So we've got a lot of collective experience and perspective on this, this panel today from many different angles. I'm going to go ahead and just throw out the question um, to you all. Like, and I'll start with you, DeAndre. From your seat as a superintendent, former teacher, principal, are you optimistic at this point about the potential for technology to be a, a, a vector that transforms outcomes for kids, and um, so, like, what do you what do you see in your in your world inside a school system that is giving you that hope? I think it's too late for me to be optimistic. I mean, ed tech in education is a reality that we cannot escape. Um, I think it's in an iteration phase right now. We're still trying to figure out exactly what works and where and for whom. Um, but the question of does it exist in ed in, in education? Uh, should we be optimistic? I mean, it's a resounding yes. Um, it's the new paper pen textbook. Um, we can't do education in this preparing kids for 22nd century without it working. Um, I think the conundrum here is, you know, ed tech profit, ed tech does it really work for the kids who need it? And are we solving for those smaller schools, those smaller communities, obviously the kids of color who are not being serviced well? Are we um, designing tools that support actual teachers? Because we all know that ed tech cannot replace adults, people that build relationship and connection. But are we thinking about how we solve to make teachers more effective, more efficient, to take away some of the time that they use 
a menial task and equip them to be better at what's important, building connections with students, helping them uh, have confidence and to be motivated. And I've not seen tools yet that really do a great job with that. There are some tools that do help teachers do things that are important, like formative assessments. So we know that constantly assessing students in a formative way in a non, in a, in a low stakes, no stakes environment provides important information for, for teachers so they can then do something about it. And the quicker teachers can do that, then the more effective and efficient they can be with their time working with students. And there are platforms that, that do that, that offer immediate assessment. I like one, and they just were, were, were acquired recently, Mastery Connect, that provides an opportunity for teachers to get information immediately for kids so they can be responsive. Now, the challenge is still, how do we help teachers know exactly what to do with, that, with those data? Uh, once they get it. Um, and I think that's still, that's still a challenge. The other thing that I'm seeing it right now in, in schools is that we have those teachers that over rely on ed tech. And so there's no responsibility for the educator to do the hard work. Um, and then we see it under reliance where there's no confidence, there's no knowledge. And it surprises me today uh, in 2020 that our programs that prepare teachers aren't being thoughtful about how to integrate uh, preparation for educational technology. So I think there are some challenges, but some systems have to change. Yeah, yeah. Mike, you have been at this a long time and seen lots of change uh, from your seat at a large publisher. What is making you feel optimistic or pessimistic at this point about? You know, it's funny. I think that DeAndre really taps into what's on our mind, what's on my mind, and this is the idea that um, ed tech in and of itself is you know, technology that you know, could have some benefit to some, but it's when it's employed in the classroom in a way where it's connected to the teacher, that's when it really unlocks its potential. Um, learning, especially with younger children, is a very social activity. And so the idea of putting a child in front of a computer that happens to tee up the right content that they're leveled to learn at that moment in time doesn't mean that they're connected to the experience in the way that they are in a live classroom where they're engaged with their teacher, where they have discourse with their classmates. It's that kind of experience that ed tech can help enhance as opposed to replace. And I am actually very bullish on it. Again, it's in the classroom. It's a question of how it gets implemented in the classroom and how it marries with the social and emotional development that teachers and students are engaged in every day. Jesse, I know this is a topic close to your heart, the, the role that teachers play. And I'm just curious, how, what have you learned in your time now at Dreambox around really how to support educators to maximize the outcomes for their students, given all the challenges of knowledge, skill, capability, attitude? I think that um, there's been kind of this evolution where in the beginning we defined success as getting a device in front of a student. Everyone remembers Maine. And if we could just do that, we could revolutionize learning. And then the second chapter was really around what can we do to add productivity enhancements with the use of technology? So an LMS or an automating a grade book. <coughs> so how can we add efficiencies to the learning process? That was like chapter two. Chapter three, which is where I think we are now, I'm really interested in chapter four, but chapter three, where we are now, is we brought these technologies into the classroom. And instead of being on the periphery of learning, these technologies can impact learning at the point of instruction. And I would say ideally, with the guidance of a learning guardian. That learning guardian might be a teacher, it might be a tutor, it might be a specialist, it might be a principal, it might be a parent. But these are technologies that surround the student. And these are ideally technologies that help the learning guardian differentiate between productive struggle and unproductive struggle. So most great learning, the way we know about learning, happens from productive struggle. Well, how does a teacher with 30 kids dynamically ascertain what Jesse needs? Am I struggling? We're both struggling, Dondre and I. But it are either of us struggling productively and moving forth toward proficiency? How does the best teacher with the best resources understand that at scale right. instantaneously? So that was aspirational, and that is happening right now, every day, 
with solutions like Dreambox. So that's exciting, but what's really exciting to me is chapter four. Chapter four is when we move beyond the learner and we bring the learning guardian in harmony with that learner so that as we seek to delight and surprise the learner to keep them engaged, to give them individualized learning, to give them exactly what they need when they need it with embedded rewards, we're actually delighting and surprising the learning guardian as well. So our thesis was that the most important variable in learning is and remains the teacher. And the teacher controls the most precious resource in learning, and that's time. So we have to earn her respect, and we have to earn her trust, and we literally have to de-risk a move to education technology and de-risk a move to Dreambox Learning. She doesn't want to martyr her kids, and she doesn't want to look like technology is happening to her. She wants to feel that this technology is benefiting her learning community. So chapter four is when we engage the learning guardian. And we deliver on-demand, job-embedded, professional learning. Professional learning to the learning guardian. And we see that learning guardian as an adult learner on the same continuum that we talked about with workforce and the career ladders. These learning guardians crave deeper knowledge. And in the K through eight space where we are, learning guardians do not oftentimes have mastery of the topics right. and the subject matters that they're asked to teach. So that's an incongruence that we, we're trying to get water from a rock. Right. So the way we're gonna be able to scale, especially for the least well-served populations, is to make sure if you are a paraprofessional, that you get predictive insights from the technology that will help you manage your classroom, that will help you ascertain what you should do in your live instruction to best meet the needs of your students, regardless of what level of readiness that they're in. So through a Gates Foundation grant, Dreambox Learning created this predictive ability, this job embedded teacher professional development, and it's just in its infancy. But that combined with predictive insights about the learning progression of students will empower the learning guardian so that she can intelligently group her students and then deliver her live instruction in, a, in accordance with what the district needs her to do, but with the knowledge that what she's doing for the group that she has formed is exactly what they need when they need it. So Jesse, you are referring to the idea that teachers need that sort of on-demand insight to help them do the right thing and for their students. And obviously that requires data, it requires intelligence inside the product. And we couldn't really have a, pro, a panel on the future of EdTech without talking about AI and big data and analytics. <laughs> um, I wanna bring you in, Stephen, because you've really worked in information intensive companies in, in the education technology business. And just give your thoughts on like, how can we make more data available how can we do that in a way that's really actionable for teachers and parents and students themselves? How can we do that in a way that's safe and unbiased and doesn't lead us to perpetuating some of the outcomes we've already and the opportunity gaps that we, we see in the system today? I, I wish I could trade questions with a few of my panelists because this one's a tough one, but I think... And others can jump in. <laughs> Help them out. Yeah, for sure. So there, there are some fundamental structural barriers to effective use of data in K-12, and it probably will come as no shock to folks in this room. One of the things that we're working through with my, my new business is just we are dependent on data that live in a bunch of different data silos in a school district. And in any other industry, that would be you know, a relatively solvable problem. There'd be a set of APIs that were well understood and you'd just connect to the systems and you'd pull the data that you need and you'd be all set. It's actually my single largest cost right now beyond direct costs of personnel is to just work through data integration challenges in the schools that we're serving. And I think, you know, Sarah, you get in another really important point, which is that at the end of the day, we're talking about children, particularly when we're talking about K-12 education, we're talking about kids who are anywhere from, you know, three or four years old to 17 or 18 years old, and people are understandably very concerned about what information in what level of detail is available to whom at what time. Is that data stored forever? Uh, does, you know, a bad day that a kid had in third grade put a 
target on his back for the rest of his time in school? How do we work through those kinds of issues? How do we create a sense for parents and students that the data are additive and they're supporting their experience? We routinely, in business relationships that we have with companies that serve us, we exchange data because we get something in, in return. And I think if you look at some of the biggest efforts to solve this problem of data integration, often they were, and I'm thinking in particular about InBloom, where you had a parental reaction to InBloom in part because they just couldn't see that benefit. Mm. It was abstract. And it's incumbent on us as organizations that are dependent on that data and as educators who are dependent on the effective use of data to be able to explain those use cases to parents and students in a way that they understand. So it wouldn't be a panel with the Gates Foundation involved in Bloom, without InBloom coming up? <laughs> Sorry. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to throw this one actually back to you. Like, what do you, from your seat inside a system, what, what kinds of supports do you need from industry and others to kind of take this data integration and data privacy issue, sort of solve for it once and for all, so that your, your teachers, your, your um, staff, and your parents feel assured that you know, this is all going in a good direction for kids? That, that's a hard question right now with all the data <laughs> privacy violations that are going on, and and um, you know I think you know more importantly it's the integration of those systems and getting those to talk to each other so that data can flow very um, freely through platforms uh, to students and to parents so they can have access to that information. Um, but in, in terms of the, the privacy piece, I mean that's that's something my board just last week was you know grilling me on is. You know, how do we know that our, our student data is safe when we submit it to, you know, X, you know, platform? Um, and, and that's something that we're trying to tackle. So that is, that's, that's a question for us. Yeah, yeah. Mike, I want to go back to this question of, uh, that came up already around, like, personalizing learning. And, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges we have in education is that developers have in the past sort of built for the average, you know, like, one, uh, one size fits all, you know, it'll be, if, if it works in some schools, it must work everywhere. And, you know, the reality is we have just such incredible variation in context. Someone said it earlier today, like we're, we're looking at individual solutions and we're kind of for, we're losing the context. And we have such differences in resources available, teacher capacities, um, you know, just the, even the structures of schools. What, um, you know, what do you think that the implications are? Do we have better tools now to actually do product design that can lead to the level of customization needed to ensure that we really are developing solutions that can work in the least resourced environments, the, the most challenged students? Well, it's interesting because uh, you use one word that gets used a lot in the description, the idea of personalization. And if you think about you know our world, or at least the world that um, we exist in at HMH, we grew up creating broad-based curriculum. That, that's what we did and, and we still do. And so oftentimes that's seen as a little bit of the before picture in terms of you know, teaching to the middle. Um, and into that environment came a lot of other very targeted solutions. A lot of uh, growth in ed tech has happened as people have looked for very specific niche needs to, to fill. Um, and all those solutions, you know, tend to be very, very good individually, but they don't really solve for the one thing that, you know, we believe is critical to make sure that um, you truly can personalize for the needs of individual, individual students. And that is, we hand all those solutions to administrators and teachers and ask them to integrate that for themselves, to figure out how to take all that complexity and make it simple for them. And one of the ways that they do that is they say, all right, I'm going to teach the need. I'm going to take these resources and I'm going to do the best job I can with them uh, in order to be successful in my classroom. And that, pro that doesn't get the power, the full power out of any of those individual solutions because the ability to kind of make them all work in the class classroom is on the shoulders of that teacher. And so when we think about the, the future and, and sort of, uh, Jesse was talking about chapters, you know, one you know, chapter in terms of uh, integration, what can be done to really make uh, ed tech come alive and, and educational solutions come alive in a much more sophisticated and personalized way in classrooms is this ability to be able to 
help the teacher personalize. Uh, DeAndre mentioned formative assessment, and using that as a tool for understanding exactly what resources to unlock for a teacher, and making that very simple for a teacher to understand and access. That kind of um, connective tissue between the types of great solutions that are out there is really the kind of thing that will help teachers implement with fidelity and with the, the greatest impact the kind of solutions that are out there. So um, solving for that ability for the teacher to really uh, leverage things in ways that um, they can't today because there's so much administrative and, and intellectual knowledge that they have to put into just sort of integrating things is a, is a huge opportunity for us. Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit on one of the raging debates going on right now is, you know, we have this challenge that we have to catch a lot of kids up to get them to grade level. That requires personalization, but it also requires holding that bar high and ensuring that kids get access to rigor. And, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about, like, grade level standards versus personalization and feels like an either or, but obviously it has, we have to be able to get to both. So, DeAndre, I don't know if you have thoughts on that or, or Jesse, like, how do we get both those things going on at the same time? that we're holding the bar high for all kids, but we're also supporting kids who are far behind to, to catch up and get their personal needs met. Yeah, that, that's a huge issue that we're trying to grapple with right now. And the way we're approaching it is through the development of competencies. And so we are creating these competencies so that ideally we can, you know, kids from pre-K through 12th grade can progress at their own pace and rate um, that deal with not only just the academic needs, but also like the social, like the, you know, how do we want these young people to be when they leave us um, kind of skills and knowledge and dispositions. And the way we're thinking about it is that these competencies will be at a very high level for everyone. Uh, and we'll spend a lot of our time and our resources trying to help um, scaffold and support the different needs that students may have. Um, but I think as a district, we set the bar um, pretty high with what we expect from all of our students. Uh, and I don't think there should be a choice between personalization and rigor. Like, your personalized path should be rigorous, uh, appropriately rigorous, that gets you access um, to all options, you know, career, military, university, et cetera. You should have access and be prepared for anything you want to do and be. Uh, and I think schools and districts have to set that bar, both in policy uh, and in the learning expectations. And in Texas, we have a very uh, clear, our state really defines what kids should learn. Uh, but we think that kids have to learn much more than that to be prepared for this world that they are living in and that they will inherit. So, you know, we're doing that way. We're, we're going about it by trying to develop a, a, a competency-based district, uh, hopefully one of the first in Texas to do it. Uh, we're looking forward to support from people like you. <laughs> the one thing I would say is that I think we're getting used to, we have this kind of calcified language and approach. There's instruction, there's assessment, there's application. Scaffold, instruction, reassess, application. Well, what if we threw it all together and we had technology-supported learning environments that seamlessly integrated instruction with formative assessment and application and provided scaffolding real time? Because that's what we know about learning. The feedback that comes when the child is struggling productively and making mistakes, forming their own hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, discovering why the hypotheses worked or not, and then getting the formative supports and the scaffolding, when that happens dynamically, instantaneously, all together, instead in three separate steps, that's when the, when the brain engages and that's when learning happens, ideally. And guess what? If a child isn't ready for, if a second grader isn't ready for second grade content and you bring them earlier into the curriculum and you put them in that kind of integrated environment, guess what the data shows? The data shows that that, pers that young person accelerates and catches up. So this notion that we have that's forming unbelievable decisions in policy at scale about instruction and then assessment summative more formative, but I would say formative is better, and then the application of that knowledge <laughs> is old school. We know so much research that says that's not the way the brain works, that's not how learning works, and yet we build up all these structures in government, in policy, in schools. Just today there was an article in the New York Times, probably many of you have read it, 
that talked about the unequal distribution of money in, within districts. So you have well-funded schools in districts, and in that same district, you have uh, kids that get, schools that get $1,200 less per kid. At scale, in that school building of 500 or whatever it is, think about how many learning guardians you could get, how much more professional development you can get, how much more technology, like, we have to think about how our policy and our, I would say, outdated notions of how we fund and stand up learning communities is harming our kids, and it's harming the least well-served generation after generation after generation. And when we come into forums like this, and so few of us are actually proximate to those schools that are underfunded and proximate to the learning guardians that are serving those deserving kids in that environment, we come up with these macro solutions that we want to apply in our greater wisdom on these communities. And that's not what they need. They need us to be proximate and come in with empathy and understanding so that we can partner with them and customize what we do for them in a way that works with their strategies and their learning communities. I, I so appreciate that Jesse brought up that point because I've been stewing here since we sort of had this, this phrase go by a little bit earlier that sort of equated high need and low resourced yeah. schools, yeah. right? And it's true. It's absolutely true. And it's a stain on a society that that's what exists today. And it just, think, let that hang there for a second and think about the fact that we are acknowledging that the students that have the greatest needs are receiving the least resource to meet those needs. And we have an obligation to think about how we change that. And it's not that any of us, I mean, you can understand where that comes from. We all wanna provide the best for our kids, but when you take a step back and you look at what that's doing, it's not healthy for any of us. And it is self-interest. It is self-interest, but you've you got to call out the elephant in the room. Yeah. We're, and we're talking about, does ed tech work? Well, if you go to, into an environment that has a third of the funding and a third of the staffing and twice the level of need, and then you assume that because we put this really cool computer program in place that it's going to magically change outcomes, then we're deluding ourselves. So I think that's got to be part of the conversation. Can I tell a story about that? So we developed this predictive um, insights. You know, it helps the learning guardian actually predict what the child needs, where they are on their learning path. And I was really so excited about it. So I went to talk to a superintendent in a large urban school district about how we were going to really take his summative um, work and actually use it in reinvest those funds into a formative, more high impact solution and it was going to help their gifted and talented I was so excited about it and he folded his arms across his chest I you know I gave an impassioned presentation and he folded his arms across his chest and he said you know Jesse what you're talking about is a capacity building solution I'm like no 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 this is like data predictive insights and I would go, went out on with my personalized learning and and he's like you know what Jesse uh, this year how many guess how many open teacher positions I had at the beginning of the year and I'm like, don't know. He's like, 300. I'll be lucky if in two months I have enough paraprofessionals to fill those while I look for actual teachers. And what you just described to me was something that I can give to my paraprofessionals who are just worried about keeping sanity in the classroom, who, haven't, who aren't certified teachers, and who are going to be told, this is what you might want to do with Tommy and Jerry and Raul and you just, you're, you're talking about a district capacity building solution. And I'm like, proximity, baby. And I'm always preaching about proximity, and I wasn't proximate. I went in there, and I had my little thing, and I just didn't, I didn't listen. And now I understand that there are things that we build that funders fund that can do amazing things for certain populations. The magic of them will not come to life until we sit with the people who are the learning guardians, and ask them, how might you use this capability to support your district strategies? And it needs to be affordable, um, because we can create the best product, and we can create the greatest learning experiences for adults. But if the price point doesn't make sense for communities of color and school districts of 
that, that, uh, that have severe poverty needs and uh, under-resourced, which have been under-resourced since the beginning of public education. It's not a new phenomenon. But until there is some type of corporate responsibility to say, hey, we believe so much in this thing that we're really to identify the least served districts and schools in our country, and we will support you with this product. I think until a movement like that happens, we'll still have this conversation. Mm -hmm. So I was a recent Gallup poll, actually, um, that came out with New School Center Fund that talked about how um, schools with, that are serving higher income students are often using ed tech to do creative, collaborative, um, sort of expanding opportunities for learning. And lower income schools are often using ed tech products to do practice and drill on basic skills, um, which is certainly a needed thing, but you know, is calling into question sort of like, who's going to market for whom with what? And um, just thinking a lot about, you know, how do we make sure that the experiences that students are getting really are rich and deep and lead to, you know, the kind of mastery-based, broader set of measures of competency that, that you were talking about. Uh, and so I mean, that's a, a challenge to the ed tech community to think about. I want to I wanted just maybe close out our formal panel part here with just uh, maybe a, a pivot to optimism, since this is, we, we're going deep here. Um, if you had, you know, there's a lot of investors in this room. If you had, you know, a significant chunk of resource to try to go after the thing you, the thing you think is most important for your organization to really get to this sort of breakthrough level of results, what, what would you focus on? And you can name the dollar amount. It may be different for different ones. Anyone want to jump in on that? Well, for me, it's chapter four. It's treating the learning guardian as an adult learner who needs to get closer to the content to be a better ambassador for that learning. And it's, it's hard and it's elusive and it maybe doesn't have the same return profile because it's professional development and the margins aren't as high. But I would argue since, that, since learning guardians control the clock and control your access as an ed tech provider to the students, it's an investment. If, if you need to get to a certain level of usage in order to get to that proficiency to prove that your solution works, then engage the learning guardians in the journey. Chapter four for me. Awesome, others, Mike? You know, when I think about it, um, the idea of how you bring all the variety together that's out there, I know we, we've all talked about this a little bit. Um, I would say that that's something that's happening that's a bit new in our space. Lots of companies, you can go back you know, 10, 15 years, we're acquiring lots of different pieces with the idea that if I acquire all these pieces, they'll work together well and there'll be a great outcome. And most of those experiments have not worked out well. Um, and in fact, a lot of companies have divested of different parts and pieces because of that and they've tried to narrow their focus. But there is something that's going on now that's a, a little different in terms of the way uh, companies are combining and, and coming together. You're seeing a lot of it actually on the ed tech side where you had all these different point solutions that are coming together into bigger suites. Um, I would argue that HMH is doing sort of the same thing from a position of strength and core and intervention, but also bringing more and more point solutions together from a digital supplemental side. But the focus is much more on making those things work together. And as uh, has been mentioned a couple times up here, formative assessment and understanding student growth are sort of the connective tissue between all those things. And as people have been thinking about executing on broader scale to bring all the different types of solutions that are out there together into a better ecosystem, this idea of doing that and executing on it and not just executing on the acquisition is really something that is a little bit new and it's going on at scale at a lot of different places around the industry now. Awesome. Steven, you want to add anything? I would just say if I could wave a magic wand uh, and had unlimited resources, I would try to break down the barriers that exist today between schools and the communities that they're in so that you can have more cohesive use of resources. Students spend 80% of their time outside of school and we talk about ed tech as though it happens only in school and learning happens everywhere. Awesome. John Rady, any final uh, Of course. Yeah. Uh, in addition to <laughs> what do you these need? items here. Um, and this is going to shift slightly, right? Like, talk about formative assessment. But um, what I've learned is that teachers also need to learn how to be better coaches. Uh, so tools that help teachers coach students. And if you ever played a sport or participated in something, you know you got better uh, because you got in-the-moment feedback and coaching. And that's something that 
needs help with. Another realization I had recently was that sometimes our teachers don't know how to be good nurturers. Um, and so how we develop their capacity to, to nurture children and relationships to build connections. Uh, what I'm struggling with is seeing so many of my students um, lose their lives, like literally die, murder, or go to jail um, because they made bad decisions. So what are the tools that help teachers and students think through these challenging mental, non-academic issues um, that is prevailing our country. Um, I think that is where we need the most R&D, uh, is how are we solving this mental health, uh, this lack of social skills, lack of good decision-making judgment, um, how are we dealing with the ills and the traumatic experiences that kids are having. You know, I, there has to be some ed tech solutions that both empower teachers and students and families to deal with these things. Uh, so it's not just the academic side anymore. It never has been, it definitely isn't now. Uh, but it's also about just people and how we develop and build people. Um, I'm interested to see where that goes. So if I had a, unlimited resources, it would be to solve that. Awesome. So I want to bring our house whips uh, into the conversation as well as you all. We have Karen Cater, who's the CEO of Digital Promise, and Phyllis Lockett, the CEO of Leap Innovations in Chicago and beyond. Um, Apparently, House Whips are not supposed to have their own opinions, but I know that knowing not these possible. two ladies, uh, <laughs> they will have something to say. So I'm going to ask you guys to lead us off in questions and, uh, and then get the audience engaged. Yeah, fantastic panel. There were so many things touched on um, between thinking about personalization, the difference between personalization, and it's not a trade-off. It's a false false trade-off with, um, with rigor and having kids do uh, deep work. Um, connecting it a little, and so much else, like so many things, that was fantastic. Um, connecting a little bit to the rest of the day, I think it was Jeff Ma, um, from founder of Alibaba, who said, um, in the future workplace, what the skills people will need are um, those that are uniquely human. And so if we put our heads around what is uniquely human and we connect it to technologies that are in schools, it's actually super interesting. I love what you said about kids like solving challenges in their real life. Technology supports them in that. They can do research, they can find resources, they can get mentors in the community. Um, so many things um, develop their skills of inquiry, find, you know, find what they need, find help. Um, so my question is, do you have kind of a, play, a school or a classroom or a learning situation recently that you saw that you just thought, yes, everybody needs this kind of an experience? So maybe beyond the kind of thinking ed tech in terms of like math skills, but like what are those environments that you might have seen that just are powered up? Um, maybe. Well. I was um, in a classroom and the teacher separated her students into on grade, beneath grade, and above grade groups. And one of the students went into a different group, you know, kids are smart, and ended up going into the above grade. And what I saw, when I saw them, uh, the, the student, there was one student who became a coach and a mentor to the infiltrator <laughs> student. <laughs> and what happened there, <coughs> was magical because in order for the above grade student to be able to articulate the mathematics to the student who was struggling, they had to get to a deeper level of understanding and that was a step in their pathway to fluency. And so it's not just about the technology, it's about the harmony between the live class experience and the technology and the things technology can do to prompt that. And that child was so proud of helping and there was something about just being a part of a community and helping your your fellow student do something because of your expertise. There was something very empathetic about that. That was great. Hi everyone. We at Leap Innovations we've piloted over forty ed tech products and I'm so engaged with this concept of chapter four. You're absolutely right. It's chapter four. Um, Talk to me about the kinds of technologies, right, that transcend the classroom that we're going to need in chapter four and that connects to the learning that is happening in the classroom. Oh, boy. I share this chapter. <laughs> um, well, I'll just say, you know, what I was getting, and I don't know all that's in chapter four. I need to get a copy of the book. But, uh, you know, what written that. <laughs> good to know. Um, you know, what I'm getting at when I talk about the, the community experience is recognizing 
that what we really are trying to do is not just raise children who can um, read and write, do math, but we're trying to raise healthy, well-adjusted youth who are contributing members to their communities, who feel an affinity for their peers and who have strong developmental relationships with adults in their lives. They're engaged, they're motivated, and if they also get the academic skills that they need, that would be good. You know, I'm not dismissing that at all, but there's so much of an emphasis on how we do the academic piece and we ultimately we get what we measure for. And so I feel like part of what we've got to do is give these practitioners, because they are critically important in this process, they are the ones who are the front lines of those relationships, we've got to give them the tools to speak about what, what they're actually accomplishing and what that, we've got to give them some way of measuring the value add that they're creating and helping to steer their efforts so that they're, they're getting that result. But if all we're going to measure is students' proficiency in um, English language arts and math, uh, we're not going to get there. I would say, Phyllis, that it's one thing to have data, formative data, that gives students um, scaffolding in the moment. It's another thing to have predictive insights that say, these five students in your class are not on track for their interim assessment, or not on track for the year in assessment. That's good, but what's great is if you can say, because these five students are not on track, if you do this with student one, and this with student two, and this with student three, they will be on track for that interim assessment, and we'll have milestones that will confirm that for you. So you de-risk it for the learning guardian, you individualize it based on desired outcomes, and you make it dynamic right there in the moment. That's coming. And I think chapter five uh, of that would be, <laughs> we've gathered so much social uh, data on students and their families that we know that this strategy on the technical academic side may not work because of these other barriers. And first solve these barriers, right? First make sure that student um, has received um, some love, some affirmation, a hug. There was a study of the number of black boys that received a hug or was told that they loved, that they, that they were loved. And the numbers were just devastating. How I many kids had never received that? Whenever it's spoken anything affirming to their lives. It doesn't matter what strategy you use in the classroom, if that barrier is there, if it's hardened, it will not work. And so it's how do we blend the two? How do we make sure that we see every kid, which is challenging for teachers to do, um, but how do we make it so that they see every kid and they attach the right strategy on the technical academic side um, to, 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 to every student? That has to be chapter now, but five, hopefully. Awesome. Four and a half. Four and a half, I can work with that. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, what do you, what do you as uh, ed tech leaders, Jesse's looking at me like I'm going to ask some crazy question, because I can Wonder tell why. She, she's like, what? Um, what, as you, what can you as ed tech leaders do to bet, better support school districts? Well, I think we've got to acknowledge the environment in which school leaders work and recognize that their priority every day is interacting with kids. And you know, when we call and we try to talk to somebody in a school and we're, we're just pitching a product and we're not respecting the core of the work that's being done, I think that's something that has to change. And I, you know, I've audited a bunch of that. So I worked in a, in a much larger company before. And you, know, you hear some of those sales calls, and it just makes you cringe. Yeah, I, I do think that's a key. We do need to be a little less focused on just selling something that we happen to have in our bag, and much more focused on you know, how we help and drive outcomes in schools. The sales will take care of themselves as long as we're actually helping what goes on in the schools that we serve. Hi, my name is Doris, and I work with um, public schools, rural and urban, to change the way they do school. And I really can't even express how much I appreciate this conversation. It's the one we need to have. And what we've learned over the last several years working in schools 
um, to make change is that the teachers need to be empowered in the same way that the students are, and we need to personalize learning for the teachers. I love that you call them learning guardians, and the chapter fours and chapter fives will be um, will happen when we start looking at the teachers and really getting in the classrooms and understanding the obstacles they face. And just to, to add, we, you know, we work in schools where the kids don't have computers. Um, large school buildings where the only computers are chained to the desks in the libraries. So looking at ed tech, in isolation is never going to make you know the change where it's most needed and um, I'd really love to hear your thoughts about what you're seeing in a changed um, outlook on teacher development and the teaching practice if that makes sense the teaching profession Thanks. Well, I'm hoping that maybe some element of chapters four and five are going to think about professional development as not an event, right. but as something that's constant, so that when you're dealing with an issue that's in front of you for the first time, whether it's as a teacher or as a mental health provider or as a counselor or in some other context in the school, that there's that intelligent system that supports you in making decisions in real time. That would be, I think, a lot more valuable from a professional development standpoint than just reserving Veterans Day and one other day in the spring to get everybody together in, a, in an auditorium. I think we're probably gonna need to wrap, but I love this end note, which is like, for all you future work people, what's the future of work for teachers need to look like? How do you help them get what they need? I think that's been a great message coming out of this. All right, we'll do a little quick poll now. Who is leading this conversation more optimistic about the potential to change outcomes for the students that we care about most? Yay! All right, who's pessimistic, anyone? All right, well, Bart, we'll <laughs> talk later. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much to our panelists. Great, great time to come.